My name is Herbert Small, uh, First Lieutenant, Army Air Corps, retired. I was in the uh, 52nd Squadron, Bomb Squadron, uh, 29th Bomb Group, 314th Wing of the 20th Air Force, stationed on Guam. Uh, my childhood started out on March 23rd, 1924. My father died in 1934. I was 10 years old, leaving my mother with three young children, a widow. I began work at 16 in 1940 and then left high school in my junior year for a full-time job. The thrust at that time was money. Uh, we had no income whatsoever and as I said, three young children. The war began, of course, you all know, December 7th, 1941 at Pearl Harbor. I volunteered for the Aviation Cadet Program of the Army Air Corps in May of 1942 at the age of 18. Uh, I passed all, well originally in order to become a, an aviation cadet you had to be a college graduate. Then they couldn't get enough men so they dropped it down to two years of college. Then they dropped it down to a high school diploma. Then they drug up the dregs of the barrel and all you had to do was pass their exams, physical and mental. And believe me, they put you through the ringer. In the meantime, the uh, Army Draft Board called me. And I said, you can't draft me. I just volunteered for the Air Corps. They said, no, 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 you have to be drafted. So what happened is they made an agreement between the Air Corps and the Draft Board is I was drafted uh, with a whole group of men. They got on a bus and went to the railroad station. I went home and waited for the... Uh, Air Corps to call me. Well, they did call me within two weeks, three weeks, and uh, I went off to basic training. Basic training I did with a wooden rifle, and it still had my civilian shoes on. That's how bad things were up at Camp Devens in Massachusetts. After basic, I got a 10-day leave, and I went home, and lo and behold, I got married. And when I left mom, uh, I left her a little package. <laughs> a little package is now 60, 69 years old. Anyhow. <laughs> to you. There's an older package. <laughs> Con Congress said in order to be an officer, you had to be an officer and a gentleman. So in order to make me a gentleman, they sent me to college. So here I am at Southwestern Miss. Presbyterian College in Memphis, Tennessee, no high school education, and I got two years of college credits uh, for six months, three months, in, um, in regular civilian college. In fact, it was real southern. The architecture was beautiful. It was like Yale, but very small. And uh, being a southern college, uh, we marched into the dining hall and of course the students were still in session at the same time. We marched into the dining hall, sat down at these long tables and benches, and uh, being cadets we sat at attention and were served by black waiters and white coats and white gloves. That was a southern school, not the army. Anyhow, I got two years of college credits at Southwestern and uh, I had never finished high school, and I still have a certificate granting me two years of college credits. I uh, never went back to school when I got out of the service, which I, sh which I should have, but I had a wife and child at home, and I had to go to work. While at college, we soloed in a Piper Cub. Piper Cub was a little single engine, two passenger, forward and back and made out of canvas and we flew out of the, the cotton fields of Mississippi and uh, I soloed in that thing 
and it was a type of airplane, if you got in trouble, all you had to do was take your hands off the stick and it would, it would come out of the spin by itself. So that was my solo. Uh, after college, I went to SAC. SAC was uh, San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center in San Antonio, Texas. We were there for six weeks and they put us through all sorts of tests again, everything imaginable, even uh, depth perception uh, and psychological and of course um, educational. And at the end of the uh, training at, at SAC or testing at SAC, uh, you sat down in front of a board of officers and they said, uh, Cadet Small, uh, you're not qualified to be a pilot. You are qualified to be a navigator or if you choose a bombardier. I thought about it and a navigator sits in a dark hole, never sees anything, never sees daylight, and he pushes a pencil all day. I said, no, that's not me. I said, I want to be out in the daylight. So I chose a bombardier and um, in all this, I had two years of schooling between uh, gunnery school, air to ground, air to air, navigation, and bombardier schools. In gunnery school, we were chastised for shooting up the cattle out in the Texas desert. <laughs> it was a, we'd, we'd fly in a little two-seater open plane and uh, you'd have a strap holding you in and you lean out of the rear seat with a 30 caliber machine gun. It was like shooting fish in a bar. It was fun. But my whole service time was fun. <laughs> Anyhow, from there we went to grad to Bombardier School in uh, where was Bombardier? Uh, Memphis, Tennessee. They sent us to Bombardier School, and I met two of my best friends there. One was a Jewish kid out of Brooklyn, uh, Bert Levy. Uh, and I can't remember the other one. Anyhow, at Bombardier School, you graduated as a second lieutenant. And um, you went up on the stage and they awarded you your, your bars and your wings and they handed you a sheath, sheath of paper, which were your uh, assignments. Uh, everybody got the sheath of paper except about 12 of us. We didn't get any. We didn't get any uh, orders to go anywhere, so we're sitting there waiting and waiting. What the hell's the matter with us? <coughs> we didn't get assigned anywhere. So after the graduation, they brought us into a, another room and said, "You six have been chosen for a secret project, and you have to, you're you're going to be sent to Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska, in the middle of nowhere. What's a secret project? Nobody even knew. Nobody even heard of a B-29 at that stage." We get to Lincoln, Nebraska, and they said, well, we have nothing for you to go home for 10 days. Oh, well, in between graduation and Lincoln, they sent us home for 10 days. We got to Lincoln, they sent us back home for another 10 days. So we had a ball. I was assigned to the 52nd Bomb Squadron and was sent to Pratt, Kansas, which was a training uh, field for organizing the squadrons into bomb groups and bomb wings, etc. In training, <clears throat> it was all a big game. We flew in an airplane called an AT-11. It was a twin engine, <clears throat> uh, nice little airplane, and uh, two students would fly, two bombardier students, and of course a pilot. One student would navigate out to where our target was, <clears throat> and the other student was bomb. And then coming back, we'd reverse, and uh, the other student would bomb, and the, and the other student would uh, navigate. <clears throat> and our target was a uh, bullseye painted in the desert. Uh, and it, we, <clears throat> we used a 100-pound bomb filled with sand and a black fuse in the tail. When the bomb hit, the black fuse would go off and you took pictures of where the fuse was in the circle, if you hit the circle, and that's how you got scored in your bombing ability. <clears throat> in the center 
of this circle was a little wooden shack like an outhouse. And if you ever hit the shack, you were a hero. We spent, as I said, spent three months in Pratt training as a crew. Um, my wife was with me in Pratt, Kansas. She was also with me in Bombardier School, Midland, Texas. And then she was pregnant at that time and got malaria. She uh, visited the, at the hospital there. Uh, you know, the, the cadet wives had a group and they would visit the hospital where they were bringing back veterans from the Pacific War. And obviously one of them had malaria. Mosquito bit the malaria one and bit mom. She ended up with malaria carrying a baby, which at the time was unheard of. You can't do it. But we have the proof you can do it. Uh, we had good times there, a lot of parties. And then we would do whiskey runs. <clears throat> a couple of crewmen would take a B-7. Kansas was dry. There was no liquor in Kansas. And you can imagine an Army air base <clears throat> and no liquor. We would take a B-17 down to Texas, load it up with whiskey, and fly it back into the base, which but didn't have any police other than our own. And that went on for two or three months. And then uh, one month we come in with a whiskey run and two big black cars came pulling in as the ship landed. Who was it but Internal Revenue? <laughs> they confiscated the whole load and we lost it. <clears throat> but we continued the whiskey runs and we had great parties. I remember one in particular. Uh, my wife going around, she had a few drinks, going around cutting ties off. That was the first. And who do you think she picks on? The colonel. <laughs> Not the lieutenant colonel or the major. Our colonel, he was wing commander. She cut his tie off. <laughs> oh, ho, ho, big joke. But that's how we trained. I was assigned to the 52nd Bomb Squadron and was sent to Pratt, Kansas, which was a training uh, field for organizing the squadrons into bomb groups and bomb wings, etc. So we organized there. Oh my, I arrived in, in, uh, in uh, Pratt, Kansas by train and they, I was picked up by car and taken out to the base. And it must have been about midnight when I got there and the offices were closed. So I went to the uh, flight line, which is open 24 hours a day, and the officer there signed me in, and he says to me, oh, by the way, here comes your pilot, and in came uh, Captain Douglas. He was an experienced 29 pilot, and he was training other pilots in handling the 29. They were all B-17 pilots. Some had come back from Europe. Some were just out of school. So he was training them. He says, I'm going up on a, a training mission. You want to take a ride? Oh, my God, of course I want to take a ride. I checked out a chute, ran out there, got in, and uh, it was unbelievable, the airplane. It was so big and, and roomy and everything. It was, it was like sitting in your living room. Anyhow, we're shooting landings at night. And about shooting landings, you just take off, circle around, come down, touch the wheels, go back up, circle around, and this new pilot is practicing. And I'm sitting in the nose, I'm having a ball. And about the third landing he hit, he hit a little hard, and the main gear on the right side collapsed. <laughs> and the plane came in, down on its wing, huh? skidded along, and I'm up in the nose, <laughs> almost shit my pants. <laughs> and they yelled, get out, because you don't know if it's gonna blow up. We uh, jumped out, ran like hell. No, it didn't blow up. And uh, they hauled it off and repaired it. But in the meantime, that was my first experience in a B-29. <laughs> Seven o'clock the next morning, they got me up back in an airplane, back in a 29 again, like falling off a horse. Mm -hmm. First thing you have to do is get back on. And when we got back on, everything turned out all right. The B-29 was made up of 11 men. You had five officers and six enlisted men. The five officers starting at the nose of the plane 
was bombardier, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, where the navigator was over here, back to back with the co-pilot, and across from him was the navigator, and across from him was the radio man. In the rear of the plane were three gunners, radar operator, and a tail gunner. The 29 was the revolution in, in air flight. It was the first airplane to be pressurized, air conditioned, heated. It was a forerunner of today's airliner. Uh, we did not wear oxygen masks, only going over a target. We wore nothing but a one-piece nylon zipper suit in our underwear. And most of the time I flew in my civilian shoes. And that's the way we flew because we were very comfortable. We could get up and walk around, uh, sit and talk to one guy or the other guy. And 29 had a tunnel, was about 30 feet long and 30 inches around. And that's how you got from the forward pressurized cabin to the rear pressurized cabin, because in between were the bomb bays, and you couldn't pressurize bomb bay. So in order to get from one end of the plane, you had to crawl through this tunnel which I did quite often, but mainly we used the tunnel to sleep. It was padded, we'd get up there and sleep. The 29 had 12 50 caliber machine guns, plus a 20 millimeter cannon in the tail. It was quite de a deadly machine. Bombardier had six 50 caliber machine guns, four above in one turret, two below in another turret. The CFC man who sat up on top, looking out a blister on the top of the plane, and he controlled all the guns electronically. In other words, if I had an attack on the nose, he would throw some switches, and I could fire all six 50s with one little rubber trigger. On the other hand, if we got an attack from the uh, port side or the or starboard side, he could switch the guns over, and they would fi follow the gun sight of the side gunners, etc. We had an electronic gun sight uh, similar to the, bomb, to the bomb sight. All you had to do was focus, it had electronic uh, reticle and, you and a circle, and you focus that reticle and circle on the enemy uh, with a couple of dials and then press the trigger with your thumb and depending on where the enemy was you could fire four, two, or six 50 calibers at them. We had uh, two bomb bays. We carried a total of 20,000 pounds of bombs. 4,500 pounders. Uh, by comparison the B-17 carried eight 500 pounders. The B-24 carried 10. We carried 40. We had a 3,000 mile range. Over water our flights were. There was no land and maybe an island here and an island there. Our navigator was a crackerjack, a little Chinese kid out of New York. And he would hit the target every time right on the nose. And he would hit home every time on the nose, which was even more important. <clears throat>
and uh, we made an emergency landing there. And as I said, the Japanese still held the island, and it was nothing but a Japanese airstrip, which was very short because they didn't have big airplanes, and made of gravel and stone. That's all it was. Anyhow, we stopped right at the edge of the jungle. We were so close to the jungle we couldn't turn around. We had to wait for a tractor to come and pull us out. <clears throat> so we're sitting there waiting for the tractor, and I'm in the nose, and I look out, and this flash is coming out of the jungle. I said, Jesus Christ, somebody's shooting at us. Well, I had six 50 caliber machine guns. I call a CFC man to give me the guns. I press one little rubber trigger, cut down the whole jungle with 650 calibers. You know what 650 calibers will do? They'll tear a car apart in two minutes. Mm. Anyhow, nobody fired at us after that. I don't know who was in there, I don't know who was firing, but they stopped. <laughs> Anyhow, a tractor took and pulled us out of there. The plane was so bad they junked it. We couldn't take it back. We had to wait overnight for uh, transport to get back to Guam. And they put us in, uh, again, they put us up in the marine tents. What we didn't know, <clears throat> what the tents were right at the end of a, uh, what the hell they call them, <clears throat> night fighters, the phantoms, uh, runway. In the middle of the night, <laughs> the night fighters go out <laughs> and they come take off right over our tent and the roars were unbelievable. We didn't know what the hell was happening. Anyhow, we realized finally I went back to sleep. <clears throat> uh, that was plane number one. Plane number two, replacement crew was scheduled. In other words, if you weren't scheduled to fly, a replacement crew, some of these new ones coming in, because we were short of air, shortage of airplanes, uh, would take your airplane and they'd fly the mission. Anyhow, replacement crew came in, took our plane that day, was never seen or heard from again. Now you ask yourself, was it the airplane or was it the crew? Third plane, we were standby crew. Standby crew is you sit in a truck at the base of the tower and you wait for a call. Standby is if somebody, for example, a gunner falls off the ladder getting into the plane because they were so high you had to get a, use a ladder, especially in the tail. Uh, it breaks a leg or whatever. They don't pull that gunner out, they pull the whole crew out. And the standby crew takes that airplane, whatever plane it is. So we had to go on a mission as standby, and we're taxiing out of our parking space, and getting in the line for takeoff, and who do you think were right behind? our own ship. You can tell by the numbers on them. We're taxiing out behind our own airplane. <clears throat> now the runways were two parallel runways. You took off 30 seconds apart. So this guy would take off then this one, would, which would put you one minute behind the plane in front of you. Now the, at the air, runways were laid out so that at the end of the runway the island dro cliff dropped straight into the water, about oh, 500 feet, straight into the water. And the practice was just get your wheels off the ground because we were so heavy, loaded bombs and fuel, that you couldn't just shoot up into the air. The practice was get your wheels off the ground, get over the cliff, put your nose down, pick up 100 miles an hour speed, and then get back on your track. Well. We're one minute behind our own ship. <clears throat> he gets off the end of the runway. We're about halfway down. He noses down, never comes up. Went straight into the water and blew up. We're right behind him. I'm sitting in the nose. Whole goddamn thing blew up in front of me. Uh, what do you do? You keep going. Because uh, you got to fly a mission. The next morning, they didn't even find pieces. Anyhow, they had loaded bombs and loaded fuel. The, uh, again, you ask yourself the question, was it the airplane or was it the crew? There but for the grace of God.
We completed our mission on plane number five, four, 35 missions. The, uh, actually, we did not fly 35 bombing missions. We flew 34. The 35th mission was a photo recon. The Japanese said, we surrender over the radio, but there was nothing official. There was no surrender papers signed, nothing. So we were still flying missions. Our mission, they took three airplanes from each squadron and they gave us charts that showed uh, there should be a PW camp here, there, wherever. We went to uh, Nagoya that day and our mission was to uh, find the PW camp, photo it, and bring it back. Uh, they, we had a passenger, we had a, a lieutenant colonel from uh, wing headquarters and from intelligence. And he knew the city of Nagoya like you know your hometown. He knew the names of the streets, he knew the names of the buildings, he knew everything about Nagoya. And I sit in the nose and he was kneeling behind me and I had a, a what they called a gun camera. It had a lens about that big around. All you did was cock it and fire it. And he's pounding on my shoulders, get a picture of this, get a picture of that. And I'm shooting all these pictures. I have some of them. I'm shooting all these pictures. <clears throat> and he, he was like a kid at the circus, unbelievable. Uh, that was our 35th mission. And we, when we brought back the pictures, the rest of the squadron was loading up with food and medical supplies. They put wooden platforms in the bomb bays and loaded the platforms with case goods of, of uh, medical and food. <clears throat> they didn't put parachutes on them because with a parachute they'd drift off and the Japanese people would get it, not the prisoners. So they strapped them, metal strapped, uh, two or three cases together, loaded them on the platforms, and their job was to locate the camp, dive right into it, drop their load, and pull out. What nobody expected or realized, the prisoners came running out to the courtyards screaming we're saved and they dropped all this canned goods on top of them <laughs> killing them Jeez. they kill some but no you know nobody they didn't read about that part right yeah. you just read about the rescue daylight raids and night raids we flew both night raids were between four and nine thousand feet single file like I said, at 4,000 feet, I think they were throwing rocks at us. We were at 4,200 feet behind us, and behind us were 4,400 4, feet spaced 30 seconds apart. Now, after flying six, seven hours, how the hell are you going to be 30 seconds behind the guy in front of you? Yeah. So the biggest danger was dropping bombs from above. Uh, flak and searchlights and, and uh, bombing from above were the biggest uh, opposition we had. And uh, the scariest thing up there is being on a night raid, sitting in a nose, and get caught in the searchlights. All of us, it's pitch black, and all of a sudden you could read a newspaper. And here I am sitting in a nose. Going over a target, we wore steel helmets, oxygen, because we depressurized. If you ever got hit pressurized, everything would blow out. We were depressurized, wear oxygen, wear a big heavy flak jacket. <clears throat> and that's how we went over a target. Uh, Didn't the flak come up through your seat or something? Oh, well, <laughs> uh, we also had what they call flak mats. A flak mat was maybe three feet by four feet made up of steel plates. Oh, right. <clears throat> And we, we laid those out on the floor. But I took, um, but first of all, mine wouldn't fit on the floor because I had this much space. I cut it up to fit my seat. And I had a seat about that high of, flak, of steel protecting the family jewels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, anything came up from below, I was all right. Uh, the searchlights were the, were the ha scariest thing. We got caught in them one night and uh, I crawled into my helmet, I swear I did. 
and I, it's the only time I ever called on God because I was never religious, but I called on him and get me out of here, please. I'll be good, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do anything. <laughs> of course, when I got back to the base in bed, I the hell with that, forget it. I had to go back the next day. <clears throat> Uh, Japanese fighter attacks. The only serious one we had was uh, on my nose one day. We we're flying a formation and there's two Japanese fighters out here in front of us and they're tracking us all the way in. What they're doing is radioing our heading and, and altitude for the uh, any aircraft fire. They're fire. And all of a sudden they pull way out in front of us, turn and head straight into us. Well, two fighters come straight into us, and well, who do they pick on? Little old small. Uh, he was so close, I could see the bandana around his head, the whole shtick, you know. And all of a sudden, I see his wings blinking. And I turn my guns on him, all six firing away. I don't know whether I hit him, whether he hit me. But he, and you know, it's, it all happens in a matter of seconds. He flew right through our formation. He flew right under me and kept on going. And we kept on going. But uh, that's how the fighters work. Then one time we were assembling, uh, like I said, over outside of Japan. And two Japanese fighters, again, got up at the top of the circle and dove down through it. They didn't fire a shot. But all these 29s in a circle are shooting at him. What happens when you shoot across a circle? <laughs> Yeah. The, our planes got back the, the, the next day loaded with 50 caliber bullets in them. The Japanese didn't have a 50 caliber. Yeah. They threatened to take away our guns. <laughs> <laughs> We're shooting on our own airplanes. Right. <clears throat> we were over Tokyo one night. We had a load of 40, 500 pound bombs. And a bomb in the airplane is as safe as uh, sitting in your homeroom chair. You could hit it with a sledgehammer, it wouldn't go off. It had a fuse in the nose. <clears throat> the fuse was about that long, went into the bomb, had a little propeller on the front, and it had a fixed wing. It was a piece of wire, heavy wire, attached to the airplane, went down and through the fixed plane and through the propeller, and it stopped the spinner from turning. So it was safe in the airplane. <clears throat> so we got these bombs over Tokyo one night. <clears throat> and the uh, practice was radio man who sat right in front of the forward bomb bay would watch, there was a glass in the panel in the bomb bay hatch. It was a glass and he'd sit there and watch the bombs fall and he'd call forward, bo forward bay clear, and I'd close the doors, because the sooner you close the doors, the sooner you can get the hell out of there. You can't maneuver with these four great big doors hanging below. And then the rear gunner in the rear would watch the rear bomb bay, and he would call rear bay clear, and I'd close the rear doors. Well, this day, radio man calls up, and he says, Lieutenant, there's a bomb hung up and that little propeller in the front is spinning. I said, oh shit, you know, the bombs are my responsibility. <clears throat> it meant that bomb could be live at any minute and that there were four bombs stacked on top of it. And this bomb fell just enough to pull the wire and then hung up on the bomb below it. And uh, you can't wear a parachute, flak vest or anything out in a bomb bay. There's no room. Uh, the only thing you had was a catwalk about six inches wide on either side of the bomb bay. Nothing in the middle like most planes had. Uh, so I took everything off, went out there. I didn't go out. I opened the hatch, I closed my eyes, and grabbed the fuse that was spinning. I didn't know whether it had completed its revolutions or it had 10 more to go or two more to go, or whatever. I closed my eyes and grabbed the fuse. Told the radio man, cut me a piece of wire. I wired up the fuse so it wouldn't spin. Then I got out in the open bomb bay over the target, 
the debris from the fires coming up into the plane because we were low. I hung on to the bomb shackles. That's the big steel panel that holds the bombs. I stood on one foot on this little catwalk and with the other foot pushing the bombs out over a burning city. Anyhow, I got them all out. I didn't bother taking the fuse out of that other one. I kicked it out as it was, got back in, and collapsed on the deck. <clears throat> uh, that night, I saved 11 men and an airplane. We were scheduled for a night mission, and uh, we didn't have our own plane. We had a, a replacement plane. Uh, and it was pouring rain. It was a miserable night. And uh, the, the, the way it went was the co-pilot, we had a, a, a slide rule, computer slide rule, remember those? He would compute the weight of the plane and uh, report to the pilot. Uh, if we're overweight, we're underweight, or whatever. And uh, he reports and he says, we're borderline. Pilot looks at the tires. He says, no, we're not, we're overweight. He says, we're overweight. Yeah. He don't want to fly. Yeah. I don't want to fly. <laughs> so he says, what are we going to do? So he says to me, small, you want to fly? I said, hell no, you don't want to fly. I don't want to fly. So he says to the radio man, call in, we're aboarding. Calls in, we're aboarding. Two minutes later, the colonel uh, races up in a jeep. The hell do you mean you're aboarding? Why? Rennie says, we're overweight. Look at those tires. It was a tired old ship. He says, that tires are perfect. Let me give me give me the slide rule. He says, You're you're within borderline. Go. Rennie says, No, we don't want to fly tonight. He had a feeling. And I I got the same feeling. He don't want to go. I don't want to go. Raining, oh, it was a miserable night. He says, You're confined to barracks, all of you. Back to your barracks. The next day they called in called him in the headquarters, court martial him, my pilot, refusing to fly. Uh, he was fined $500, lost a promotion. He was up for captain. We were all up for first. He lost his promotion to captain, fined $500. Uh, they couldn't confine him to quarters because they needed him. And he, with him went this whole crew. So they kept him flying. And uh, Maybe two or three days later, we were back in the harness and flying again. All the officers chipped in $100 a piece. We paid the fine because we didn't want to go either. Yeah. P.S. The ship left on the mission, came back fine. Everything was fine. Right. But he had a feeling he didn't want to go that night. Right. And that's how things went. Right. We were on another daylight mission. And in assembly, uh, we lost an engine. Now, in, you, can't, you can't fly three engines in formation. You can fly three engines. You can almost you can fly on two if they were opposite sides of the plane. But you can't stay in formation because you need all the power you can. And uh, we radioed our commander, the flight leader, and told him we lost an engine and we want to drop out. He says, pick a target of opportunity and drop out. Now we had 4,500 pounders aboard because it was a daylight mission. We did. We feathered the engine, dropped out, and picked a target of opportunity. I went back to the uh, navigators section and we looked over the charts and we spotted a, uh, a symbol for a naval air station. It's funny, they used the same symbol we did. Uh, about 200 miles down the coast of Japan. <coughs> so. So that would be a good target, Naval Air Station. We flew down there, and as we're approaching the station, we're coming from the south, and the station is laid out east to west off a little bay. The runways, everything, the hangars were laid out east to west. We're coming from the south. And it was a clear, beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky, unbelievably so. And. Uh, as we're approaching the base, I can see it all laid out in front of me. And I said, turned around to my pilot over here. His name was Rennie Fontham. I said, Jesus, Rennie, I can't hit anything going this way. 
I said, swing around and come in east to west. Here we're flying over an enemy airfield. We go right over it. We're at about 10,000 feet. Clear, beautiful day. Swung all the way around and came in east to west. Right down the line of hangars and all the buildings. I lined up. I had perfect conditions. I was 10,000 feet. Clear, be beautiful day. We had all the time in the world. I set my sight up and ready to bomb. Bombs away. Oh, there's also an instrument the uh, bombardier has called an intervalometer. You set this for the uh, spacing of the bombs on the ground. And I had spaced it at 50 feet. In other words, I had 40 bombs that would drop 50 feet apart. Because I figured 2,000 feet would cover the whole airstrip. <clears throat> Anyhow, bombs away. I'm watching the bombs through the site, and shit, I missed. It was short, maybe 30 feet. Hangars stood there in the bright sunlight. But I had 40 of them. Every 50 feet, they, boom, boom, boom. Walked right down the line of hangars, right down the line of machine shops. At the end was a group of these huge storage tanks like New Haven Harbor. Blew them all up. Blew up the whole damn airfield. Not a BB gun was shot at us. Turned south and headed to Iwo Jima because we were, had, uh, had lost an engine, uh, which, you know, after the engines cooled down, you can start it up again. Uh, but the point is, we blew up the whole airfield. We got back, and when you finish a mission, you sit down with intelligence, and you're debriefed about what happened on the mission. And we described what we did and all, how we, we had a clear, beautiful day and we blew up the whole airfield. Now you have to read what the, uh, I don't know who wrote it up, but the award, we got the Distinguished Flying Cross for that. And uh, you have to read the award that was given for the Distinguished Flying Cross. Headquarters, 20th Air Force. Award of the Distinguished Flying Cross by direction of the President. For extraordinary achievement while participating in aerial flight on a daring daylight raid against Tachikawa, Japan, on 10 June 1945. These individuals were combat crew members of a B-29 Super Fortress based in the Marianas Islands. When they were climbing to bombing altitude, one of the engines on their aircraft developed a malfunction and had to be feathered. Due to the extraordinary bomb load of the aircraft, they could not maintain position in the formation. Determined not to jettison the bomb load and abort, they chose to bomb an alternate target of importance to the enemy. Approaching the initial point, a malfunction developed in still another engine. Despite the intense enemy aircraft fire and the reduced speed of the aircraft, they made a successful bomb run on the target by dropping their bombs directly on a large fuel dump. Fires broke out and immediately the smoke rose to 3,000 feet. 30 minutes from the target, the malfunctioning engine cut out completely. With outstanding skill, the very badly crippled aircraft was flown to an emergency landing field, and a successful landing was executed on two engines. The outstanding airmanship, leadership, and devotion to duty displayed by this crew, who have completed more than 21 combat sorties, reflect the highest credit on themselves and the Army Air Forces. There were flak fighters, everybody was fight, bah, trying to shoot us down. I don't know where this guy was, but that's what he dreamt up. <laughs> <clears throat> we had a mission to Hokkaido one time. Hokkaido was the northern island, the, you know, the three main islands to Japan. Uh, that took an awful amount of fuel, a lot of fuel, but there was a chemical plant up there they wanted to knock out. So that uh, what they did was put auxiliary tanks in the rear bomb bay. Now they put two tanks in a bomb bay. These tanks are about four feet across, they're elliptical, and they gotta be about eight to 10 feet long. They're elliptical, they're flat. And they hang, there's a cable running around them, and they hang them on the bomb shackles, one on top of the other. So uh, we're coming home from Hokkaido, and we'd emptied out those tanks, and we lost an engine, and we were very heavy. So pilot says, small, get rid of the tanks. 
I open the bomb bay, the rear one, and I hit the, the release. The first tank drops away. The second tank, tank, the forward shackle drops away, but the rear don't. Now, she's like this, drops down like that. Here you got this great big tank dragging you down. We're only on three engines. He's screaming at me, get rid of that tank. So I go and uh, I call for a, an axe. We had these fire axes, a little, a little hatchet really, uh, and an and a oxygen bottle. And I, one of the gunners got out with an oxygen bottle and an axe. He got on one side and I got on the other side. We're chopping away at this cable because it's twisted around the shackle now and you, you can't move it, it weighs a ton. So we're trying to cut the cable. I got mine cut and I look over, he's passed out on the little catwalk behind the shackle by the bomb shackles. So I called another gunner, come out, drag him out and I went over, I got a new bottle of oxygen, I went over and cut the other cable So we got rid of it. But what happened is when the tank swung down, it smashed the bomb bay doors, all the hell. You can't close them. So here we are flying on three engines with the bomb bay doors hanging down, dragging us down. Well, we made it back to Iwo. And the uh, pilot says, I don't know if I can land this thing with those doors hanging down. He says, you want to jump? It's your option. If you jumped at, at Iwo, you jumped off the island on the ocean. And the Navy had small boats running around. They would pick you up if you landed in one piece. <clears throat> Anyhow, we voted. Nobody wanted to jump. Said, I'm not getting out of this airplane. <clears throat> he brought it down. He brought it down in one piece. He was a crackerjack when he was sober. <laughs> but, oh, he was, he was always drunk. He was a great pilot. Uh, anyhow, that was another incident. Did you ever jump? Did you ever parachute? What are you, crazy? <laughs> I'm not jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. Never did it? They did it, early days they did it in training. But they killed more than they, than they, than they taught, so they stopped it. They said, take your chances when the time comes. <laughs> yeah. We were leaving Japan one day. And we're maybe a hundred miles off the coast and you know it is there's a two three hundred airplanes leaving Japan heading home and I look down I'm in the nose I look down and there's a 29 laying in the water didn't crash it crashed but it f stayed afloat and the crew was on the outside standing on the wings and so forth and I look up in front of me there's an American submarine heading for the down aircraft so I'm watching them, and at the same time, the tail gunner calls out, there's a Japanese gunboat heading for the plane. So I said, oh shit, what do we do? So I turned around, I'm talking to the pilot. I said, Rennie, what are we going to do? Are we going to drop down and help them or what? And, and while we're discussing this, a uh, tail gunner calls and says, another plane dropped down, he's strafing the gunboat. So we don't have to go. But the gunboat turned around, headed back. The submarine picked up the, up the crew. We had submarines stationed all the way back down to Guam to pick up down crew. And uh, there were codes to call them. You couldn't give your position in the clear because the Japanese gunboats were headed for you. But uh, we had submarines pick up quite a few crews. All right, we were sitting around drinking one night, uh, three bombardiers sitting around drinking in the club, and in walks our squadron bombardier who'd been away for two months. He says, where the hell have you been? He says, well, he was assigned to uh, uh, Wing Headquarters. Now, Wing is way up there. Wing Headquarters was on Guam. Uh, yeah, there's squadron, group, wing, an Air Force. If not, he probably was on the Air Force uh, duty. He was planning the atomic mission. We didn't know anything about an atomic bomb. That night we're sitting there drinking and he came in. We, you know, he sat down with us and, he, and 
the course of the evening, he says, what would you think of one bomb that would destroy a whole city? Hey, you're full of shit. Have another drink. The next morning it came out. The Enola Gay left that night. The next morning it came out that they had to drop the atomic bomb. We knew it and didn't know it the night before. The Japanese said, we surrender over the radio, but there was nothing official. There was no surrender papers signed, nothing. So we were still flying missions. Our mission, they took three airplanes from each squadron and they gave us charts that showed uh, there should be a PW camp here, there, wherever. We went to uh, Nagoya that day and our mission was to uh, find the PW camp, photo it, and bring it back. Uh, they, we had a passenger, we had a, a lieutenant colonel from uh, wing headquarters and from intelligence. And he knew the city of Nagoya like you know your hometown. He knew the names of the streets, he knew the names of the buildings, he knew everything about Nagoya. And I sit in the nose and he was kneeling behind me and I had a, a what they called a gun camera. It had a lens about that big around. All you did was cock it and fire it. And he's pounding on my shoulders, get a picture of this, get a picture of that, and I'm shooting all these pictures. I have some of them. I'm shooting all these pictures. <clears throat> and he, he was like a kid at the circus, unbelievable. Well, while we were on that raid uh, with this colonel, we had a ball. We chased trains. We had loaded guns, no bombs. But we didn't know what they were going to do, so our guns were loaded. We came down, right down to the train, chased them. Uh, we saw a formation of military. We came down, <laughs> scattered them. Then we came up. Uh, the the uh, Nagoya Harbor is just like New Haven Harbor years ago, where the water came right up to the railroad station. Do you remember that? Before they fi before they filled that all that in. So we came up the bay, and we were so low we had to pull up to get over the railroad station. When a plane is that low, you can't hear it from the ground. We pulled up, come over the railroad station, just roaring over the roof. And on the other side was their trolley terminal, where all the trolleys from that area exchanged. The place was jammed with people and trolleys, and I'm in the nose with this colonel. And we, you know, they, all of a sudden, their 29 comes roaring right over their heads. They scattered like mice. Uh, we were having a ball. We were having a ball. But that was after the atomic bomb, right? Uh, it was after the... F after no, the yeah, it was after the second bomb. Probably what they were thinking about. So then this colonel <laughs> says to me, uh, we're only 100 miles from Nagasaki. You want to go take a look? Nagasaki was the second bomb, and they just dropped it a day or two before. And as I said, he knew Japan like, you know, Connecticut. Uh, so we said, sure, we went over to take a look at it. We flew over Nagasaki at maybe a couple thousand feet. And it was unbelievable. All you saw, it looked to me like snow. Everything was white. And there was a skeleton of a concrete building here and a skeleton of a concrete building there. Nothing else, no people, nothing moved. It looked like it had a snowstorm. Did the raid ever bother me? The raids. Did it ever bother me about what we had done? We killed literally hundreds of thousands of people. Men, women, children. No, it didn't. Not at that time. Uh, it was no different than flying over Texas and hitting that bullseye. We never saw anybody. Uh, there was no feeling whatsoever. The only Japanese I ever saw were prisoners on Guam. Uh, so there was no feeling to it whatsoever. It was hit the target and go home. That's all we were interested in. Was it always night raids? Or no, daylight raids. We had both, daylight and night. So you could never see the effects of your, you were well beyond them by the time the bombs hit? Oh, no, no, no. You just saw them hit. You saw them hit. Well, uh, we were not the first planes. Your first planes had gone over and set all these fires. Sure. And uh, our object was to go just at the edge of the fires and start no fires. Right. So we didn't bomb a particular target when we were on incendiary raids. 
We just laid them into the fires. It's a lot different than how they do it now, huh? Hmm? It's a lot different than how they do it now. Oh, now they, they don't even go near the target. Right. Do it from, uh, <clears throat> the only time it ever bothered me was after the war, I don't know, it was mo months, even years after the war, Collier Magazine ran an article. And this reporter was in Japan. He was a Swede. He was in Japan the night of the raid. And he described it. How the bodies were stacked up in the streets. The bodies were floating in the rivers, all bloated and all. And he described it pretty grimly, or realistically, with the children, bloated bodies and all. It's the only time it ever bothered me. But of course, that wore off too. Life goes on. I never talked about the war for a good 50 years, if not more, until one day uh, we were going to a relative's wedding out of town, and my oldest son, Jeff, was driving, and somehow he asked me a question. We were riding with him. He asked me a question, and it started off on the war. It was the first time I ever talked about the war, and he said to me at the time, you never talked about the war. I don't know. I was too busy working and earning a living. But now, you know, I was semi-retired at that point, and uh, I have nothing else to think about. And I, my mind goes back to the days of, of the war. But uh, from then on, it's been war. I mean, I won't sleep tonight because of this. And uh, every time somebody gets me on the subject, uh, I don't sleep. Uh, the other one night out and about a week ago I went through this and I didn't sleep but the next night I didn't sleep but I was building houses so it shows you a bad economy yeah <laughs> but when I was that age people objected conscientiously yeah. and oh, they, went, they went to Canada or they refused to oh, the Europe. Vietnam they refused to, oh, you know what happened yeah. but, they refused to go to war but did anybody well uh, look, I'm it was different about. though Steve in our time the US was threatened mm -hmm. not the uh, Vietnam South Vietnam or whatever it was the US was threatened my family was threatened you my my you everybody was threatened if it wasn't for the Marines you wouldn't be here because I'd have been killed on, on, on Iwo Jima. But did you? Did anybody object to a mission? So they said you're you're going to bomb these hundred thousand people tomorrow. Well, they never told you there were hundred thousand people down there. They, they said told, you're going to bomb this section. And that's it. They never told you're going to bomb this factory. Pit. I don't know. Yeah, there were people in there. So what? It was war. Nowadays, there's such an emphasis on that. They don't want to bomb anything except. Yeah. Can't, they, you're fighting a war, you can't shoot a civilian. Right. Hey, man, he'll kill you, he gets a chance. Absolutely, yeah. But, again, that's war. Treated uh, like a hero when you came back. No, because no one knew what I did. You didn't talk about it. I never talked about it. Never. The closest I came was a Veterans Day parade in West Haven. Bill Sewell, when was Bill Sewell around? No. He dragged me out. Oh, you never done that before. And I had my, oh geez, I didn't wear my B-29 hat. <laughs> uh, and people kept saying thank you. I was sitting there in this car. I, what the hell are they thanking me for? And then one guy says, thank you for your service. I, oh, okay. That's the only time uh, it ever registered on me that I was a hero. Right. I never had the ribbons. I never went through it all as paperwork. I never read my own uh, obituary, a biography. <laughs> and that's how things went. Only 3,900 B-29s were built. 414 were lost in combat. Now listen to this. 147 from enemy fire from 414. That's almost 300 airplanes were lost other than enemy fire. Like I said, the, the, the planes that blew up, the planes were, were lost, never heard from, or never seen again. Uh, planes where our own bombs dropped on top of them. Or ran out of fuel. 
247 were lost at sea. Engine trouble, whatever. Went down, some were picked up by submarine, some were just lost. 1,500 men were killed in training. They killed more in training than they did in the service, in the combat, because the airplanes weren't perfected. What, uh, what about, I mean, you got all these grandkids, you got great grandkids, you got uh -huh. all these people now, and, you know, God willing, none of us see war. I mean, what do we, what do we take from this? You know, what's the, what's the message to the... Thank God for the USA. Thank God for America. I bless it every night. There's no country in the world like it. You can, you can have your Republicans, you can have your crackpots, you can have all over the country. But there's no place like America. But you're free to do. You're free to do what you want, as long as you don't break the law. God bless America. Believe me, and I mean that from my heart. That's not just rhetoric. Yeah. You don't appreciate it until right. you don't have it. Until it's, it. Until, it's really it, until it's until it's it's uh, jeopardized. Right. <clears throat> like I said, Vietnam War. They were going to Canada, but this was they were threatening my home. Is your hat here? Do you have your hat here? Yeah. Can you get, can you get, get, get it? Get it in the front closet, Dave. Is it, is it, is it <clears> hat? I want to see that hat. Is this a B-29 Yeah. I intended to wear it, but I forgot. Did you get the medals in the... In Let's the, see them. Describe those to me. I, oh, I can't. No, all right. Uh, <laughs> no, David's got them all on, in yeah, writing, yeah. where they were oh, awarded. I can tell you. I can tell you. Yeah. They yeah. are the... Oh, let me see that hat. That's... How's that better? You want to read that, what they are? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so the awards and accommodations. March 20th, 1945, 314th Bomb Wing VH Commendation. May 7th, 1945, Air Medal. June 15th, 1945, Air Medal, Oak Leaf Cluster Number 1. July 29th, 1945, Air Medal, Oak Leaf Cluster Number 2. August 4th, 1945, Distinguished Flying Cross. August 12th, 1945, Air, Air Medal, Oak Leaf Cluster Number 3. August 20th, 1945, Sciatic Pacific Theater Ribbon. Asiatic. Asiatic. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. I know. I saw it, so. <laughs> August 20th, 1945, Asiatic Pacific Theater Ribbon, Bronze Service Star. September 2nd, 1945, Completed Tour of Duty, 35 combat missions over the Japanese homeland. January 23rd, 1946, Distinguished Unit Citation, 29th Bomb, Bomb Group, VH. April 19th, 1946, Battle Honors, 29th Bomb Group, VH. Those uh, citations and all are presidential citations. <laughs>